so my name is Heather Warnicke. I'm a Principal Research Program Manager here at Microsoft Research. And on behalf of, on, of the whole organization, I would like to thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. I have the pleasure of introducing your final session of the day, um, someone that I am extremely pleased to call a colleague and a friend. And it is very hard to explain in such a short intro the passion and dynamic personality of Bill Buxton. And I'll tell you a little story about Bill that actually comes from this morning when we were trying to come up with kind of a theme for his intro. Because I said, Bill, we can't just do the standard bio for you. That just won't do. And I said, what do you want to focus on? And Bill said, without hesitation, we're in the land of Jimi Hendrix. Let's go with are you experienced as a theme. <laughs> and I said, OK, we can do that. And so in the spirit of that, I'm not going to take you through the usual bio information of, you know, and then Bill found himself in Toronto in the winter of 1987 working on computers. Because you can find that information about his illustrious career and his many contributions to art and science, well, on the internet. So what I am going to focus on are some experiences that you might not know about Bill or be able to find other places that I think really will give you some idea of who this man is and also should inform some of the things he's going to talk to you about today. First of all, he's a very accomplished road cyclist, which is one of my favorite things about Bill. Um, that's also my sport. He's also an international mountaineer, the backcountry skier. As a matter of fact, he's one of those backcountry skiers that doesn't like ski lifts. He says you have to earn your turns by hiking to the top. And that's very Bill. He's a proud Canadian. You know, he also has 20 years of experience in rock and roll as both a saxophonist and a synthesizer player. And on that point, one of the interesting things that I will point out about Bill in his career is that he was one of the first folks to develop the whole notion of capacitive touch, which the original work was done in 1984 at the University of Toronto and was based on trying to build a drum to drive his synthesizer. And they actually published that work in 1985, which was the first mention of capacitive touch as a mechanism in the computer science literature. He also wanted me to point out that while that work was done in 1984, that Mark Zuckerberg was born that year. <laughs> so think about that for a minute. But another thing Bill wanted me to mention, because it's his proudest moment at Microsoft, is that he had a font, the Buxton sketch named after him after he helped one of our business units. And that was something he really wanted me to mention. So without any more information, because I think that tells you a lot if you don't know Bill, that will help you understand who this man is, I will give you the very, very, very experienced and varied Bill Buxton. There you are. Thank you. So. Um, Good afternoon, and uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. By the way, uh, international mountaineer is not the thing, only in the sense, here's the class of how we can all be world class at anything. Is I have a friend, a climbing buddy, his name Barry Blanchard, and he says the world's best mountaineer is the one who's having the most fun. And by that standard, any, any one of us can be world class at what we do. You just have to be having the most fun and getting the most out of it. Um, and by the way, she can kick my butt on a road bike. Um, I, it's, so I'm a rookie. Uh, so the topic is ubiquitous computing. So let's let's dive into that a bit. And I'm going to frame before I go into the depths how I'm going to approach things. And uh, I know you came here to have a lecture on philosophy, and that's why I've brought up Marcel Proust. And but in some sense, this is one of the most interesting um, quotes that I have about how to think about research and creativity and design. And the notion is the only true voyage of discovery is not to go to new places, but to have other eyes. And in some ways, uh, my objective in the time we have is to try and help bring different optics to the things that we all see day to day. Because I think that we live in a world where people confuse invention with research. And that uh, seeing the world in a different way and taking what's already there is actually the key to creativity and the key. It's not having some brilliant new idea. I've never seen that happen. Just new ways to see things that are already there. Now, we're going to go along um, this path. And this is other bias I have, is I want to be a historian when I grow up. And, and this is largely driven by things like William Gibson uh, in this line that we've all heard, but the future is already here. It's just not uniformly distributed. Um, in the, this so-called fast-moving world of high tech, um, there's solid data from the National Research Council, I, I summarized it in a paper called The Long Nose of Innovation, that says that any new idea by the time it reaches maturity takes at least 20 years. Um, and tell me that's fast moving. Um, the mouse took 30 years from the time it was invented in 65 till it became ubiquitous in 1995. And, and that's despite the fact the first commercial mouse, which was a rollerball mouse, was released in 1968, the same year that Engelbart uh, gave the, the mother of all demos. 
Park didn't get one until 73, the Mac came out in 84, and yet I used one for the first time in 71. But these things take time. So there's a rule I have, is if I can't, when somebody comes up with an idea and says this is going to be the great thing in the next five years, if I can't see 15 years of history leading up to what they just told me, then either we haven't done our homework or we're way overestimating when it's going to be mature, according to statistics. So my examples are nearly all going to be things that you know about as opposed to some fancy new idea. That should give you confidence, not that I have no ideas. Um, and so that's your seatbelt. Um, the thing about optics and the thing about history, that's what's going to keep you secure because every once in a while I may seem to wander off topic. But I will start with a historical precedent. And this is uh, my late friend uh, Mark Weiser, uh, who I worked with when I was at Xerox Park. And we were part of a team that was developing this thing called ubiquitous computing. And, and Mark wrote this classic paper in Scientific American in 1991 um, about ubiquitous computing. And I'm not going to talk a lot about it, um, but I want to make two points because they're relevant to, again, something you can hang what we talk about for the rest of the afternoon about. And one is, is that <laughs> is ubiquity uh, means everywhere, so that's not the hard term. Technology computers, digital technologies are everywhere. The harder one to wrap our minds around is this notion of transparency. So what does that mean? Because uh, um, sometimes people say, use the word invisible. That's not what it means. It means it's transparent in your day-to-day, -day, work a day, play a day life, the technology doesn't intrude. Simple example. If the dining room table were in the bathroom, it would stand out. If it's in the dining room, you don't even notice it. Likewise, if the toilet was in the dining room at the table instead of in the bathroom, it would stand out. If it's in the bathroom, it doesn't stand out. It's not that you can't see it. It's a question of it, is it in an appropriate place serving an appropriate function such that it doesn't impede upon the activities that are normally um, taking place in that particular location. This is what my wife calls wearable computing, uh, but where you spell wearable with an H. It's about location. Now, in the notion of ubiquitous computing at Park in those days, it, they really were a bunch of computer scientists, and, 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 or we were, and, and the we really were focusing on computers, in fact, on three different form factors. Um, what we call live boards, these wall-mounted displays, um, slates with pens, wireless um, net with network devices, and even these things called park tabs, which were um, handheld devices that were wireless. Um, they were actually X servers running clients that could run on these other devices, and the whole thing was a wireless network, all networked together. And the notion was it'd be twosies and threesies of the boards, tens of the slates, and up to you know, multiple tens of, of the tabs, sort of like post-it notes. So these were all going to become really cheap. Now, I tell you this because there's a demo that many of you may have seen outside where we're using a handheld device um, with a whiteboard. And you sort of say, hey, 20 years ago. Actually, it's more than 20 years ago. It's a long nose. It was a concept. It wasn't working there. It takes time. It's not about the concept where the great ideas come. It's when the ecosystem is ready to absorb these things that they're ready for prime time. And it's all about timing. The mouse, even though it worked at the very beginning, you needed bitmap displays, graphics, uh, GPUs, and so on to, to mature, and software and applications before you had the full ecosystem in place. And that's the difference between a technology and a doodad or a good idea. And you'll notice, in fact, already with this, uh, I, I did the industrial design, not the final design, but of, of the park tab, that you could hold the PDA, the mobile device, in one hand, and I used a trumpet. Again, music is influencing things. The trumpet valves, the proportions of trumpet valves, so that the same hand that held it could operate the three buttons. So in fact, if there's three physical buttons, but you could chord like a trumpet and get the seven combinations. And so you could use that in your left hand. And when you walked up the live board, it was like the queen who has this brown ball called the orb and her scepter in these formal photographs. So you're ever at Buckingham Palace, there's a statue of Queen Victoria. And you'll notice you're sitting on the throne with an orb in the left hand and a scepter in the right hand. And that was the stylus and the, the park tab. And there was a picture of Queen Elizabeth doing this, and um, not Victoria. And, and you could work at the board, and this would be a peripheral device. And when you walked away, it would take on its own identity. Gosh, we saw that today. That doesn't make it a bad idea. It doesn't make it plagiarism. It says that's the nature of research. It's about incremental refinement and standing on the shoulders of those who came before. It's not about something brand new out of the blue. 
And that's what we do, is we try and take things and refine them and refine them and refine them till they're at a state of research well enough that you can hand them off. That, that's the job. And I'd say if I was going to say a subtext to my talk today is one of the things we have to do is break our students and our colleagues and our investors out of this notion that it's about this out of the blue invention by these magic people in black that where the great new ideas come. No, it's dogged work and research. Research is a fundamental part of, of innovation. It's not a, just invention. But we need different eyes. And we want ubiquitous computers. And we want things transparent. And so I asked the crawling question, what is this? And no, this isn't a Rene Marguerite uh, Redux. So they pause in basketball. Does everybody know what this is? Come on, somebody knows what this is. Take a, take a stab at it. Innovation is all about risk. Basketball. A basketball. OK, well, that's one answer, isn't it? <laughs> and I'm an academic, so I could say, well, it all depends on your perspective. So it could be a basketball. It could be a picture of a basketball. And in fact, it is. That's an, uh, an NBA regulation basketball. You could use that in a game. It's qualified. I think it might even have NBA certified on it, but it is. That's one perspective. That's one set of optics. So let's take another set of optics. Um, hmm. There's six of these inside of it. These are inertial sensors. They're strapped on the inside, distributed inside the ball. Oh, the ball has batteries inside to power the inertial sensors, and it's actually wirelessly charged. That's the charging pat platform It's on there. Oh, and by the way, it's got a 10 meter, 90 foot range, because it has Bluetooth transmitter inside as well. And so all the data from those inertial sensors are transmitted wirelessly in real time at six kilohertz. Anybody basketball players here? All right. Do you know on a three-pointer how many RPM the ball should be doing when you do the shot? Guess what? Between two and three, precisely. 2.2, 2.5 is the norm. Ha! Stats will tell you. You do it at two, just around over two hertz, it's more likely to go in than out. All other things being equal. Did you know what angle you should release the ball at? The optimal angle? 48 degrees. 48 degrees. And if you measure with this ball, the top players, they're within it consistently within plus or minus two degrees. The ball tells you everything. They can tell how hard you're, bound, uh, you're, uh, you're dribbling. By the way, if you wanted to, a good project for a student, is you could actually use this in place of your keyboard so you could actually send your email by sending binary by the bounces. <laughs> okay? See, that's lateral thinking as opposed to lateral pass. Okay. The, but the point I'm getting at here is this is a good example where this is either a digital appliance or it's a basketball, and the answer is yes. And it's not what people normally think about. And as a Canadian, I'm proud to say that they, they appear to be working on a hockey puck, too. I'm not sure what that means to, to just tell me how bad my game is. But, but there's lots of other things. And we could, um, we could go through all of these. But all I'm saying is you could make your own list of images of things that don't look like computers. My mother in her 80s, who could never and never would touch a computer, she could work a sewing machine, which was a computer, and I couldn't, she, I was more incapable of understanding what, I don't even understand how sewing machines work. I mean, how do you get the thread in and out through the cloth? I mean, it's just, and how to program these things. She could work those, but she couldn't work a computer. But she was working a computer. She just didn't know it. And all of these devices are around embedded in the environment. And, I, I, and we all know that, but I want to put this here as a reminder to the nature this range and the quantity of gadgets that are digitally enabled that are starting to populate the ecosystem, both in terms of range of devices and quantities of any of the devices in that range. Because we're going to get to a place where I say, the good news is there's a growing industry in demand. The bad news is it's going to bury us and it, it, it's going to stifle the market if we don't do something about it. But because I'm going back as a historian, I'll say, there's nothing new here. One of the hot topics people have right now is, oh man, we're gonna, make, we're gonna have new kinds of smart watches. What an incredibly great idea. Well, 
I happen to collect things. For about 35 years, I've been collecting things, not to be a collector. I never knew it was a collection. I just thought I was doing my research by having reference objects that I could test um, and use to learn from. Um, so there's a couple of these. Uh, this watch, I just happen to have it on. I told you I owned them all. This is the world's first watch with capacitive touch sensing. And it's an LED watch, and you touch it, and it turns the LED lights on. Because you know, if you're on all the time, the battery's going to drain in a day. But that's not just the fact it had capacity. 1976, by the way. But it's not just that. This is the watch, to the best of my knowledge, introduced the notion of double click in order to drill down deeper. So a single touch tells me the time. A double click tells me the date. Right? This is before these things were happening on mice. But the point is, it's just, it's really interesting. Uh, who knew? Why didn't we know? Right? If you work in the space, if you don't know the history, what business do you have? Why are you doing this? You're probably going to reinvent the wheel. Who can afford that? This watch, um, actually, it's in my briefcase, but I don't have it on. I only have two arms. Um, it's the first calculator watch. This is the second generation of the first calculator watch. It's from Citizen, from 1978, from, um, from Citizen. But in, it was the first calculator watch that came out of Japan. You notice that already they hadn't figured out um, they're standardized on the keypad to enter things. And so around the bezel, you have these little buttons that are indented so you can get the ball, tip of your ballpoint pen to type and enter the numbers and the arithmetic operators, and that's how it operated. But there was this really fascinating thing that comes out of this as a designer I just love, and I love this watch. I love wearing it because those same indents that are there for a perfectly practical reason to get the ballpoint pen so you can actually operate it because they're too close together for your big fat finger, they actually give it a jeweled fast because of the faceting of how they reflect light. They give the whole watch, it's like having diamonds around the bezel, except they're functional diamonds. And it's, it's fascinating just watch how the evolution comes about the control and how we started to experiment with these things. Um, this is my favorite watch. This watch is from 1984, which you've already heard is the year that Mark Zuckerberg was born, but also the same year that the first Macintosh came out. Now this watch I have here. And this watch is really fascinating because it looks pretty plain and simple. It is a calculator watch. It's a calculator watch that has a small LCD display, as you can see at the top, but mostly it's just an analog face. But to enter, I just do a stroke down to enter a one, and then I do a plus sign to enter plus, and I draw a seven to enter seven, and I draw an equal sign on the crystal, and I now found out that, yes, children, it is eight. So the point I'm getting at is, why, why, is, why am I talking about this? This is a watch from 1984. It cost $99.95. It was mass produced in 1984. And it had a capacitive touchscreen on it. And it has character recognition built in it that works. And by the way, the watch still works, unlike most of our computers from 1977, or sorry, 1984. But more to the point, Compared to the touch devices you have today, how many of them can you enter data eyes free? Write down names and numbers. Because I have another watch, it's the one beside it on the top right hand corner on the slide, which was released the same year, that also had a data bank. So you could enter names and phone numbers, 50 of them, count them, 50. And when you searched and did retrieval using character recognition, alphabetic and numeric, it would even do automatic uh, word completion. OK, 1984, that is 18 Moore's Laws ago. That means the chip in this today would have 250,000 times the compute power, a quarter of a million, roundabout. And so instead of breaking our arms, patting ourselves on the back for how genius we are about making all these new hot gadgets like smart watches and this and that, we say, what the hell have we been doing for the last 20 odd years? <laughs> Actually, nearly 30. And and I don't say that, but I can't say that because that's the long nose. That's the way it is. And actually, the most innovative thing you can do is you can cut the long nose to 15 years from 20. You're a genius. You're in business. But the point is, if you don't know the history, you don't know how well or badly you're doing. And if you don't have this, 
you can immediately say, hey, with 250, with a quarter of a million times more compute power, man, I could add Bluetooth to this, I could add memory, I could have it be a peripheral of my phone, it could bind, it could actually tweet without looking. I could write down phone numbers out of the phone book with, while my geezer eyes are looking at the phone book and assuming you still have a phone book and, um, and enter. But the point is there's stuff to learn. Every one of these things teaches us. But this one's really cool too. This is the most beautiful jeweled, it's just lovely design, the manufactured watch from LG. It came out in 2009. This is a total smartphone. This has got um, full size SIM chip in it, Bluetooth, Wi Fi, address book, email. Uh, what else am I missing here? Um, calendar, camera, and video conferencing. It is the total Dick Tracy package. 2009. So I'm not trying to say what's going on today isn't interesting, but it becomes actually more interesting if you drop the hype and view it in context in the history of things and see it as a continuum, and then you can start to see how are we doing and not get dazzled by this latest doodad. But the things are happening, and we can learn from the history about what's going on. And here's one of the things that I think I've learned, I've, I pretend to have learned, and that you can characterize, in some sense, the history of interactive computing in three phases. And because there's three phases, each phase is characterized and delimited by the miracle of its existence. So I'm going to give you three miracles as well. See, that's better than Proust, right? Now, the first one is 1975. So let's just say arbitrarily it's with the Altair computer when that was released. And did anybody have one of these, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> It, it, was it cool? Was it amazing? It was a handbar backplane. I know, and there was no keyboard. There was no display, right? You got, he, this is a guy who gets off, spends money on blinking lights. And he loves it still because it was emotional, right? Right? It's, 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 it started something. And from that phase, things started to get better. We started to have keyboards and displays. You still had to save your text buffer every 30 seconds because the editor was going to crash. How many people remember that? Come on, give me a break. You're not that young. <laughs> okay, well, we're all only 28, right, or 39. So, but the point was, the miracle was it worked and people will actually buy it. And that was the whole thing. Technology dominated the whole stage. The thing was, from a, as computer scientists, electrical engineers, and industrial designers, uh, now nah, there were still industrial designers, to computer scientists, electrical engineers, we got these things, they worked, and we could build businesses around them. And it got better and better and better. It's the functionality started to happen. And then we got to this point where um, you, you could, in fact, rely on it. And when, you, and when your text editor did crash, you were furious. Interesting, right? When did that change? When did it change that you didn't expect it to happen and it stopped happening? And when it did happen for some action, you, you were upset. It's interesting, right? So we get to the end of that phase. That's sort of maturity, phase one. Phase two happened around 2007. The, the iPhone, to give it credit, is probably the catalyst that, or the, at the tipping point. It wasn't the cause, but it was the most iconic example of that. Uh, Microsoft Surface, which is now called PixelSense, was announced at the same time that brought the same type of character. But it was really interesting because the functionality didn't change. The character of the interaction changed. And the miracle was it not only worked, it flowed. The functionality was essentially the same. The previous smartphones had touchscreens. IBM released a smartphone in 1993 that had the entire front of the phone as a touchscreen. It only had two buttons, an on-off switch and a volume control. It was called the Simon. And you would used icons. It had all the same properties. It had the same applications. But it wasn't the same experience. This changed everything. It flowed. And that's kind of where, not kind of, that's where we are today. And, and that flow as, as, and that quality of experience is what's enabled the proliferation of all these other gadgets that, that I've been showing in the, in the blue slide uh, before, and you, a slide that you could have uh, produced just as easily as me. But this takes us to the third phase, and this is where I, I want to go. And the third phase is <laughs> you can't see the computer. There's no gadgets. You look through this window into the information space of the stuff that's relevant to you and it's accessible right in front of you with, with nothing intruding. I'm not saying that's the office of the future, the home of the future. It's a metaphoric image. 
The miracle here is that stuff not only worked well, not only worked, and not only flowed, it worked together with the other things in the ecosystem. And that is as significant of a transition, I would posit, if not more, to the long-term health of our industry and the benefit of our culture and society and our clients as any of the other stages. And I want to explain to that why. And it's because of the well-known Buxton's Cracker Jacks principle. Okay, who here is old enough or is unhealthily enough to remember the tagline, the slogan for Cracker Jacks? The more, the more you eat, the more you want. Right? So, as it is with our appetite for Cracker Jacks, because there's a prize inside, the more you eat, the sooner you get the prize. That's the other benefit. With our digital devices, the more I get, the cooler it is, the more I want to consume. The market's based on that. That's where the growth is, because everybody insists on growth. But the problem is, if you eat too much, you get full. You might even get sick. But your appetite goes because you can't hold anymore. You've, you're at capacity. And exactly the same thing happens with these doodads, all these gadgets, all these things that are starting to proliferate our, our technological ecosystem. And we will reach a point of saturation. And I'll explain why. This is my scientific. So I am a professor. And I, so. If anybody doesn't, if there's any designers here, and you, there's, I'm sure there's mathematicians and scientists here who can help you out explain this highly scientific thing of scientific visualization that I'm about to show you. This is on the y-axis complexity and time is on the x-axis. And this shows how the declining complexity of individual devices through this wonderful thing of phase two, the flow. But here's the Cracker Jacks thing playing in the red line. The cumulative complexity of a bunch of simple things still goes up. We do not, even though we reduce the complexity and the quality of use of any single thing, the overall complexity of our environment is continually increasing. Or else there's no growth in the market, right? And there's this thing called God's law that says that the number of brain cells you have, how fast they fire, and how much you can remember, and how fast you learn, is a constant. And by the way, that's a very godlike thing because the truth is, uh, as my age is telling me, they actually go downhill really fast. Right? Now, the point is this: is that any of once you get above the human threshold of frustration, or what might be called the complexity barrier, the, the functionality and the things no longer have value. You're full, like you ate too many cracker jacks. And that's the challenge. How do we? avoid that problem. And, the, and, and I'd argue is precisely by stop focusing on the individual devices as if they're islands. It's no longer about the device. Phase three absolutely depends on phase one. It has to work and it has to flow. But that's no longer sufficient going forward, I would argue, in how we conceptualize our products and services if we want to sustain the growth and the and the health of our industry and the benefit to our, our customers, whoever they may be. A classic example, this literally is a picture of the remote controls in my living room on the coffee table. Any one of them I can explain to you with no problem. There is nobody in my family who can explain how to turn on the VCR <laughs> and connect it to the projector. I mean, it's a, you have no idea how many, I, I could be in Beijing and get a phone call from my wife who's trying to watch a movie because she's got friends at the cabin, right? I, I'm not joking. Thank God for Skype, um, <laughs> if you can work it. But you can work it, so that's the good thing, right? So, so here you go, and you say, well, all right, let's, how do we avoid this? If we anticipate it soon enough, before we hit the turning point, we can fix this. And so there's two rules that I think that we can apply to everything we do going forward to help do that. And the first rule is the foundation rule. 
Every new product and service must provide great experience and excellent value. That is, it works and it flows. It meets the criteria of the first and second phases of, of interactive computing. But that in itself is not sufficient to greenlight the project. That's not good enough if we want to go in the long term. The second rule is, but each of them must also reduce the complexity and increase the value of all of the others in the ecosystem. Things must work together. That is to say, if I add something, it not only has to increase the value of all the things I already have, it has to reduce the complexity of all the things I already have. And furthermore, all the things I already have have to reduce the complexity of the thing I just bought, which already in itself had great value, and reduce the complexity. Okay, I might be losing you, because this sounds like having your cake and eating it too. It shouldn't be possible. So can it be? Can I give you an existence proof? And if I take, go back to the seatbelt, right? The future's already here, it's just not uniformly distributed. If I can't give you some examples that show where you've already benefited from what I just described, but because of optics you may not have noticed it, then I should shut up and go home. Refund your money. But I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna give you an example. Here it is. That's not my actual car, but it's the same model, year, and color of my car. It's a Ford Escape. That's not my actual phone, but it is the phone I use. Now, individually, each of these things have value, they perform their functions well, they're well designed, and they're competitive. But what happens when you bring them together? Some really interesting things happen. When I'm driving in my car, and I have my phone in my car, question, please somebody answer this one, where is the phone? It's in the car? Uh, it's not the right answer. Anyone else? No, it's not. Where's the phone? It's the car. That's getting better. It is the car, but not quite. I think the only, the one good answer is yes. Or everywhere. Or who cares? It's not about the phone. Those are three answers I like. Although, you, you, got, you got a good, that was a good one, just it's, it is the car. The point is this, think about it for a moment. Technologically speaking, when you're in the car driving, if you've got sync in your car, or whatever you use in your car, the only things being used in the handset are the SIM chip, the Bluetooth chip, the battery, and a little bit of logic. The speech recognition, the microphone, the speaker, the address book are in the car. And by bringing these two things together, you have this synergistic thing that happens, and they, they're unified. But it's even more than that. That's just a technological sense. Who can tell me the name of the interaction language that people will tell you uh, is the interaction language used in Windows mobile phones? I'll accept the old name if you want. Metro. Okay, Metro or Modern. modern. All right. I would put to you, if you're using Metro or Modern while you're driving your car, you should lose your driver's license. And in fact, you can't, you, you, sh you, you don't need to. When you're in the car, not only does the underlying hardware change, 90% of it changes, but the entire interaction language changes from touch and eyes, which are the dominant human, from the human perspective, the channels you use in working with Modern, to speech in and speech out, period. Eyes free and hands free, as it should be. So we've had a 100% change in interaction language and a 90% change in the hardware while I'm driving. So now watch what happens. I park the car. I'm still talking to my son on the car. I pick up the phone, the handset. As the car's shut down, I walk away and I keep talking. And nobody notices the miracle, the miracle that happened. In the course of that conversation and that transaction, 100% of the UI changed because it's now back to Metro or, or modern, and 100% of the phone is in my hands. And you didn't notice it, why? 
because it's not about the phone. It's not about the technology. It's about the conversation. It's seamlessly transitioned the hardware, software, and the interaction language, and we don't even notice because it's so well done. It's like plumbing. You shouldn't notice it except when it's broken. Right? Same with this. It's seamless. It's elegant. It's beautiful, and it puts a smile on my face every time I encounter it. But it reduces complexity, increases value of when I bring the two things together compared to if they were working independently in the same context. Was that QED proof? At least one. One counterexample doesn't make a proof, but it's a good start. I want to talk about the mechanisms that are in line here that are essential to say about the qualities that are going on, what's going on here. What we saw with that car example on the phone is what I would say at the technological level is an example of seamless aggregation when I bring the phone together with the car into a new entity with new properties and disaggregation as I move apart. And that aggregation and disaggregation take place seamlessly. In order that inconsistency of technology gives me consistency of experience in terms of quality of what I'm doing, in terms of my intention. But at the functionality level, the service for me, there's something else going on there, which would be what I call, would characterize as graceful augmentation and degradation of capability. And these are separate. One's sort of from the second is from the human perspective, the upper one's more from the technological perspective. The bottom's got to do with intention, the upper row in terms of facilitating um, platform. Now, what's interesting is that when we do this, you might assume that aggregation and augmentation correlate strongly. So I bring things together to, I got more things, so I get more, more uh, I've augmented the capabilities. And you could say, absolutely, when I bring the phone together with the car, I have seriously augmented the speech capabilities, recognition, and synthesis capabilities of my phone. And likewise, when I get out of the car, I've clearly um, degraded the quality of the speech recognition in today's technology. They, they're, they're, they're different. But there's also things happening in these other directions. Because I, when I'm driving with the speech, I cannot play solitary right, by speech. There's lots of things on the phone that it's capable of doing that I can't use, rightly so, while I'm driving. So if actually, in aggregation in this case, in the car example, I've augmented parts but I've degraded other parts. And conversely, when I get out of the car and I return to Metro, I'm degrading some of the speech and other things that are car specific, context specific, but I've augmented capabilities um, th that, I, that are appropriate when I'm not driving the car and I have eyes and touch. And the thing about this is I don't notice this and I don't miss the stuff that's gone if it's well designed because you know by the context how to do the appropriate triage, what to amplify and what to attenuate, if you will, and how to do that technologically. And what I'd like to say here is that these things here are transitions. They're not states, right? They're this, remember I talked about flow the flow now goes meta, and it's not about the flow within the device, but the flow within the relationship and the changing social relationship among the devices. And this has to be done by design. And the, some of the qualities that have to drive the aesthetic and the design and the attention to detail, technologically and just um, design-wise, are here in terms of the grace, seamlessness and gracefulness. And all of that, of course, presumes reduction in complexity and non-intrusion, so I can focus on my primary task. This is, now you can sort of say, well, this is kind of obvious. Well, I'll say, no, it's not. If any of you have worked on designing user interfaces and stuff like that, you will have encountered places where you've gone and you've got the new design and somebody's done screenshots of the new interface on the wall, arrows showing how this screenshot goes to here and this button takes you there and so on and so forth. And I'll explain why I'm pulling this out by making the worst joke 
that's my favorite joke I ever made up. What do transitions and Canada have in common? Pardon? <laughs> I missed that, but I'm sure. It... Nobody knows they're there. Nobody knows they're there. Pretty close. Here's the opposite. Here's my answer. They're both dominated by the states. I almost got kicked out of a conference for saying that. But they thought I was American. It was a Usability Professionals Association. They thought it was very inappropriate that I was making jokes at Canadians' expense. But they didn't realize, but I was in Austin, Texas, that I was actually Canadian. I was, I was rat ragging on the Americans. But that's, um, I just thought it was funny that people who are supposed to be designing systems have so little sense of humor and are so anal retentive that they can't play with ideas. But anyhow, it's, it's fascinating. Um, it's, we live in a rich, varied world. Um, but the point I want to say is this. And it's a serious point, that historically, our tradition is you're anchored at your computer to work, and the context, physical, social, mostly doesn't change. As we have wear, mo mobile devices and transitory, like we saw in the car, even in the middle of a conversation, in the middle of a transaction, all of those parameters of context, social, spatial, whatever you want, can change in the midst, and the system has to adapt and change, degrade, aggregate, disaggregate, seamlessly to make those. And so my view is this. This is what happened for flow, by the way, that people started to spend as much attention to the detail of the transitions as they did to the, 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 the endpoints, the states at the endpoints of those transitions. And it's exactly the same thing here. As we have these transitions in terms of these devices coming together and coming apart, it's critical that they be appropriately designed and with as much attention to detail as the landing places and the places of departure. And this is stuff that doesn't photograph well. It doesn't appear in magazines. It's not going to be as obvious as you got this font wrong for this particular interaction or design language. But the feeling is way more important than the visuals. Right? We spend way too much time on the ocular centric and not enough on the gestural and that, that visceral part of the body language. And so we come back to the car example. And so I say, well, let's extend the example. Why single out the car? Why not have my Canon EOS 5D hook up my phone? If I've got, spent the money, because that's not a camera, by the way, that's a highly a uh, capable computer that happens to have light in and pixels out. And it's got more signal processing than the space shuttle had. So when I have it beside my phone, why can't it pair as seamlessly to my phone as could my car? So that when I take a picture with my SLR, where I can control depth of field and all these things, it goes immediately there and I can send it off to Instagram. Why wouldn't that be possible, right? I mean, all I have to do to change a relationship here with a person is come this close and do this. <laughs> he knows that this is weird. <laughs> but at least he knows I was there. But if I come up to this computer and wrap my arms around it, it has no idea that it's being molested. Right? <laughs> and, and the point I'm just getting at is that if you go to the washrooms here and wave your hand in front of the, the paper towel dispenser, it will respond to you. But your computer won't, unless it's empty, right? But, but dead batteries are in computers too. But the point I'm getting at is that there's all these cues about location proximity that can really affect how we do these things. But the fact is, the complexity of getting my images from there to my phone would be a lot easier if my phone could couple to my camera as seamlessly as it could couple to my car. Another example, I take my Surface RT. It doesn't have a SIM chip in it. Why should it need one? I've got one in my phone. If I bring them close together, the fact is, right now, I can and I do use that. I can connect them by Wi-Fi so it can actually get off on, on the 4G network. But most people don't know how to do that. And by the way, you're charged double, the, connect, the, the data charges at least, if you do that. And some carriers won't allow you to do it. But why? But isn't that weird? You can have your car connected to your, for SMSing and other things to your phone, and the, nobody cares in terms of the carriers, but when you have your laptop, they charge you through the nose. 
and it's really hard to connect. So what, how does that make sense? But, but would it make a difference? You not only reduce the complexity of doing that, you now only need one, you don't need another charge, another card, another bill to pay. It's a unification, things are simpler. But I bring that example up not to complain, but to point out that it's not just about the hardware, it's not just about the software. The topics what we need to do here, it also involves redesigning the business models and redesigning the partners and redesigning not just the relationships amongst the devices, but re negotiating and rethinking who are your partners and what are your relationships in terms of business. And as we move into the society of appliances, it's not a technological play, it's a social cultural play. Who are your partners? How do you work? How do you work together? How do you join? Because the society of appliances live within the society of people. And so let's go on further and give you another example of how this, from the business and the, and the whole part of this, the business technology and design, how these things fit together. Bus shelter. Big Nike ad on it. So I walk up to the Nike ad, and I pull out my phone, and I point it at the ad, and I click a button, and it sends across, and up pops a route map that gives me all the information relevant, centered on that particular little corner where I did it at that bus shelter so I can get that stuff. I can use the touch screen on my phone to control the interface on the screen or my voice, just as I would with a touch pad on my laptop to the screen on my laptop, because Quite frankly, why would I use the dinky little screen here when Nike's going to offer me this great big honkin' display that get, lets me see the map in its entirety? It's way better. And then I can just pull it back in here, the information I wanted, and leave, leaving nothing behind there that, I, that was private and having nothing, um, let's say, malicious on my phone in complete security. Interesting. By the way, that's exactly the same scenario, but just with different costumes on, that we saw in the demonstrations with the office thing, with the phone coming up. Now, I want to think about this from perspective. This example shows how this notion of the society of appliances and ubiquitous computing fundamentally changes advertising online, right? Up till now, Advertising online has been really annoying pop-up ads on top of the applications, which you put up with because you get stuff for free, the services for free. What this does is completely reverse the roles. I have a pop-up ad, sorry, I have a pop-up application on the ad. The advertiser gives me real value. They get value because you notice I've put a Nike, wa a watermarked Nike swoosh in the middle of the full view cone of vision, quiet advertising, in the map. So Nike gets their imprint, they, it's all monitored, and all of a sudden you change everything because it's really hard to compete for market share in advertising on browsers on desktops, but this is open turf. But it comes back to who are your partners now? Who does the back end? Who does the networks? Who serves up the ads? Who monitors the data? Who, if, they're, if you're doing transactions like buying things back, who does the accounting, et cetera, that? How does that happen? I suggest if you're an online advertising, you don't normally think about outdoor advertising companies as your really important partner going forward. Remember what I said about these things change because it's where things happen. Every place you see a poster or a sign, paper or otherwise, it is going to be an interactive display in the next few years. And the question is, can you connect to it? Can you not? What are the nature of the transactions? How do you do it? How do you make it seamless? How do you make it trustworthy, secure, and have value for all parties concerned? And who needs to be your partner to make that happen? And that's just one example. But it starts to bring this thing where you realize we've got to get the experience right. We've got to get the technology right. And we have to get the business right. And as we move forward, it's not an, enough like it was in phase one to primarily just focus on the technology. We need at the table, in the discussions from day one, business, experience, design, and technology at the table to drive it because these three competencies are essential to get it right, to make it flow in the society of appliances at the same standard that we saw starting in 2007 with the flow on the individual devices. Now, at Microsoft, for example, we're doing stuff around this. Besides the car, you could see that smart glass starts to fit into, um, into the pattern of going down this path. But it's just one.
but I'm trying to sell a concept, not a company, not a product. This is stuff we work on here because that's our job in, within research. But what I will say is that no matter who within our industry of technology, and I wrote this out because it's really important to get this right, that in the future, the quality of experience will be determined by how products work together in concert with the rest of the ecosystem, not just by the quality of experience of any product on its own, no matter how good that experience is. And that is the challenge for the future growth and the future value, to actually let us get on with our lives and the quality of life and the quality of experience in our business life, our home life, our educational life. And, and, and if we can get it right, it's great. And the kind of exercise is do a mood board like this, pull these things up, and then start saying for every one of these things, what couplings could you make? Let's see, there's a gas pump there. Why is that there? Because the gas pump is a computer where the display is liquid, but it has an LCD. But when I go in my car, which is also digital, and pull up the gas pump, when I fill up with gas, why isn't that display giving me a diagnosis to tell you, hey, your tires are low, um, all this other stuff? And by the way, uh, why doesn't it fill up my MP3 player at the same time it fills up the gas tank and give me that opportunity? Because the gas pump is just a kiosk. That, but, but it knows it's a gas pump, it knows where it is, and it knows you have a car, and it has your credit card already. I'm not saying this is what should be, I'm just saying, okay, possible business opportunity. Um, what happens, we already talked about the camera, but all of this heart rate and other stuff. Um, your jawbone, the, the earpiece, why can't that hook immediately up through Bluetooth through the same channel to my digital SLR that also is a video camera so I can use it to narrate the video and use that as my microphone? Or you can go through this. I actually don't want anybody messing with my avalanche beacon, which is the top left hand, um, because my life depends on that. But, but already the refrigerator, hey, think about that for a minute. The refrigerator is the most important information appliance in your home. If you can leave a note for your kids, your wife, that's where you put it. All the stuff that's important, that, that's way before Facebook when you post stuff up so everybody can see the pictures, report cards, all that sort of stuff, unless I'm just dating myself. But um, colleagues at Cambridge, uh, our MSR Cambridge did a project a few years ago where they just did a simple thing. They mounted a slate on the fridge where you could text to the fridge as opposed to a person. So now you can just text to your kitchen, to the fridge, to, like, hey, I'm gonna be late for dinner, but I'm bringing, home, I'm bringing home takeout. Or the first person home, could you turn on the oven? Right, you could text to a location. The technology doesn't change. It's just how things are integrated. And you can start to change these relationships. But these, working with these pairings is just really, really interesting. But ultimately, I'll just close on this and then we can take, have some time for questions, is this. It's, it's exactly what this theme is all about, connecting the dots. Where the dots are the devices, they're the needs, the services, the context, the players, the people that are always in this amorphous, ever-changing network that, we, that passes for our lives. And how, does the th how do things adapt in such a way that the technology recedes and lets the quality of our work-a-day life and our, our play-a-day life and our family-a-day life actually improve because of the technologies we make. And it seems to me that the closing comment I'd say is this. Phase one was, my God, it works, we can sell it. That was the miracle. The reason why I feel so strongly about phase three is this. Now that we can build anything, what should we build? What and why? And that's a value statement. Because to answer that, you have to say, what is my value system like? What is important? Because we actually can do pretty much anything now. And I have to say, most of our technological training has not equipped us to answer that question. But as citizens and as humans, it has. And that's where design and social sciences can actually come and contribute as full-fledged members of the team to help us make the best answers, or at least approaches to these questions that, poss that are possible. We're just human. We don't have to get it right, but it's our own fault if we don't try. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to take questions.